welcome to today's session of Pridex Academy. In today's session, we're going to discuss the concept of value at risk by historical simulation. We'll model the VAR and we'll backtest our model with actual data. So this session on financial risk modeling has been divided into two lectures. In lecture one, we'll study the VAR and we'll understand why we study VAR. We then plot the daily return data in line form and in distribution form. We then characterize risks in these plots and then we understand how industry professionals quantify risk using the value at risk concept. We also revisit or visit the different approaches of measuring VAR and then we jump into our main topic which is VAR calculation by historical method and we also use a practical approach to measure the VAR for a particular period. We also see what the information the VAR models give us and then we visit we do the VAR modeling by historical simulation we learn the algorithm and also the background concept. We'll briefly visit the VAR modeling by historical simulation and backtesting part, which will be in detail covered in the lecture two, where we would gain experience on hands on coding, where we would build the model and we'll backtest it for different periods. We also deploy different statistical approaches to determine the good models and the bad models but today we will briefly revisit the concepts of lecture 2 to grab what is coming in the next lecture so why study var var is a widely used concept to quantify risk in the financial industry I'd go far and say VAR is the backbone of risk measurement in banks, investment banks, mutual funds, hedge funds, and any other industries that deal with risky financial products and instruments. Let's take one example. Ever wondered how the futures and options margins are being calculated by a broker? It's by the method of value at risk or VAR, an expected shortfall technique with some tweaks. So we start by doing the line plot of a S&P 500 data from the year 2000 to 2020. In the horizontal, horizontal axis, we have the time in the unit of days or years. And in the vertical axis, we have the levels or prices of S&P 500. We can see uh, since 2000, the S&P 500 index have gained from 1500 levels to present days 3000 levels in 2020. But in quantifying VAR, we need to plot the daily returns instead of the daily close. So this is the daily return plot of the same data instead of the daily close. This plot looks more like a volatility plot where each day's returns has been line plotted in a time series like fashion. In the horizontal axis, we again have the days or years and in the vertical axis, we have the returns in the unit of percentages. In this plot, the upper limit is placed at 15% and lower limit is placed at minus 15%. The central tendency of the return of the daily return of S&P 500 index has been placed close to zero. We also notice that most of the returns, most of the daily returns falls under a particular range of which is a higher limit of positive 2.5% to minus 2.5 percent although there are few outliers here in 2008-9 crash 
and here during the 2020 crash and this outliers is actually the most risky returns which cause devastating consequences to one's portfolio let's now superimpose the two plots the line plots and uh, of the close price and the line plots of the daily return price of s&p 500 and see what picture can we conclude from this so here we have got ridden of the vertical axis i mean we still have the axis but it has no strict units on the horizontal side we have the dates so as you can see during the periods of higher volatility we have experienced a crash in the close price of the s&p 500 data uh, here same for 2020 where we have experienced crashes or corrections so in during the period of higher volatility the 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 close price usually experience a combination of any of these three conditions which are a crash a correction or a general bear market also these periods of higher volatilities marks the phase the phase transition for a bear market and a bull market Periods of lower volatility means good for is good for the bull market. So we can see from 2008-9 period to uh, 2018, we have experienced a long bull run because the volatility was low and there were very few outliers. Please note that this is not exactly a volatility plot. This is the daily return line plot the volatility plot is slightly different from this where we incorporate a logarithmic factor as well so let's move and see how we can differentiate or classify the different zones from the line plot let's revisit the daily line plot the daily return line plot again to repeat the central tendency is placed at 0% meaning that most of the returns most of the daily returns that the S&P 500 has seen from 2000 to 2020 has a value close to 0% or plus 1% to negative 1% range the positive side is on the top of the 0% range where the returns have positive values up to about 10 to 11% on the negative side we have experienced several observations which extended close to minus 10 11 or minus 12% so if we are on the positive side then we are in the profitable zone provided that our strategy is a long only strategy that means we are bullish on the S&P 500 so this is not much of a problem if our returns are on the negative negative side is low and let's say less than minus 3% then we are in the tolerable zone which means that daily returns of small negative numbers or percentages are not very much devastating for our portfolio but indeed decreases the value of our portfolio by some degree what is most important is that the risk zone where there are heavy occurrences of outliers and which causes devastating consequences to one's portfolio as we can see there are many accidents or crossovers during the period of 2008-9 crash and during the period of covid crash in 2020 so here there we need to hedge the risk or else our portfolio would have seen a bleeding result a devastating result so usually the industry professionals 
place a threshold line in the edge of the tolerable zone and the risk zone to quantify this risk. This border line in between tolerable zone and risk zone is called as the value at risk and is measured by several different approaches which we'll see in the later part of this lecture. Industry professionals use a bar or a distribution plot instead of a line plot. Here on the right, we have the daily returns line plot that we have just seen in the previous slide as well. So in the vertical left axis, we have the returns from positive 10% to negative 10%. We have divided this whole return range into bins. A bin means we have, for example, if you see here, the bin has a lower limit of minus 0.2% and the upper limit of 0.09%. So if any of the daily return observation fall under this range, then uh, observation will populate this bar. So as expected, the central tendency has been close to 0% and most of the returns, about 70% 70 per, 70 of the returns falls under the range of positive 1.5% 1, 1. to negative 1.5%. Now let's investigate the bar plot or the distribution plot or the histogram plot as they call it sometimes. So in the vertical axis on left, we have the frequency or number of observations. So as we are discussing, we have divided the return, the daily return in equal intervals of return ranges, which we call the bin. Like each of these is a bin. So for example, this bin, which is a lower limit of minus 0.5% and the upper limit of minus 0.2% has seen an observation of around 550. That means during the period 2000 to 2020, there has been about 550 instances when the daily returns fell under this limit that is from minus 0.5 percent to minus 0.2 percent so in this way we can plot the distribution of the daily return here again we can see a normal distribution like curve but this is not exactly a normal distribution so let's quantify the different risk zones in the distribution plot now. So here, as you can see, the central tendency is close to zero and has seen the highest number of observation in this range. The right hand side of this central tendency is the positive return zones. Please follow the bin values beneath the distribution plot to see whether we actually fall on the positive side of the daily returns. That is, our daily returns are positive. Indeed, we at the right hand side of the distribution plot is the positive side. So we mark it as the profitable zone as our strategy is long only strategy. So any returns that is greater than zero will fetch a positive return, a positive daily return, and this is good for us. Small negative returns until about minus 2.26% is under the tolerable range. That is, those risks do decrease the value of the portfolio, but those risks doesn't cause devastating consequences for our portfolio. But what we should be concerned is about the tail part of the distribution. So this is the hump of a distribution plot 
and these are the tails of a distribution plot usually we call the left left part the tail as this is the extreme risk part which we need to hedge or manage the risk zone as we have discussed causes the most devastating consequence for one's portfolio so we have seen many times that industry professionals usually associate a confidence level term with every model so what are these confidence levels so as we can see from the plot from the distribution plot that most of the returns about 70 percent of the returns fall from the range of minus one percent to about positive one percent so we can be 70 percent confidence that our returns are with our daily returns will fall in this range that is from minus one percent to positive 1.27 percent please note that this is not exactly i mean we haven't uh, measured it actually so this is a representation 70 percent confidence level but it's not actually based on data or anything just to explain the concept of con confidence levels so as we grow our confidence levels our return limits would widen that is for 80 percent confidence we can expect a return range of minus three or minus one minus 1.4 percent to positive 1.6 percent similarly for 90 percent confidence level the return levels broadens to and similarly for 95 percent we capture more area in the distribution plot and for 99 percent we capture the 99 percent area of the distribution plot that means our returns will occur from the range of minus 3.4 percent to positive 3.6 percent if we are 99 percent with the 99 percent confidence so you probably have seen that industry professionals mostly use 90 percent 95 percent and 99 percent confidence levels so we we'll discuss only these two confidence levels we will also not discuss the 90 percent confidence levels as those are uh, that is rarely used 95 percent confidence level and 99 percent confidence level are the two most used confidence levels in the industry so 99 percent would naturally capture more area of the distribution plot so as we have seen in the risk zone part the positive side of the distribution is profitable for us so we don't care about that part because that part doesn't have any risk in the left part we have a tolerable zone which captures re daily returns of low negative returns so that is under the tolerable part so that is also not our concern what should be our concern is the left hand tail part which carries extreme risks that is extreme low negative returns we bring back the 95 percent confidence level area again so we bring the 95 percent here on left so that we can quantify only the left part that is the tail of the distribution plot here the area is not the appropriate way to represent but actually lines so we get rid of the area and introduce these threshold lines of 99 percent confidence level and 95 percent confidence levels what does it mean is that we are 99 percent sure that our return will be our daily return will be on the right of this line that is we are 99% sure that we, if we have invested in S&P 500 with a long-haul strategy, our daily return 
will fall from minus 3.4 percent to I mean we can see as we can we have seen we can see really higher returns like 10 percent or 11 percent as well similarly for the 95 percent line we are 95 percent confident that our daily return from the S&P 500 data would fall from the range of about minus 2.3 percent to any number in the positive daily return part so whatever falls in the left hand part of these lines is the extreme least risk daily returns or the, the uh, carries the extreme risk so we call these lines the thresholds the var or the value at risk so for one person var we expect one percent of this distribution plot or the negative returns to fall in the left hand side of this threshold line and we expect 99 percent of the returns to fall on the right hand side of the of this line so one percent var or a var with 99 percent confidence level is interchangeably used in the in the risk industry so let's quickly define the significance and confidence so a five percent significance var is called a five percent var industry professionals usually don't use the word significance explicitly most of the times a five percent significance var means a value at risk with 95 percent confidence level as we have seen in our discussion on 1% power and 95, 99% power here as well. So to repeat, for the 95% confidence level VAR or the 5% VAR, which are actually same, what it means is that 5% of the daily returns from S&P 500 will fall on the left-hand side of this line and 95% of the daily returns will fall on the right-hand side of this line. So this line is actually the quantification of risk and we call it the value at risk so how do we know that our var level is placed here or here we can know the var levels or the var lines by uh, if we know the equation of this distribution Usually if this distribution is normal or even close to normal, we can define this distribution with, a, with an equation. But in our present example, and in most of the real scenarios, this real distribution cannot be represented by any equation or a finite numbers of parameters. In that cases, we have to use the historical data to understand uh, or to calculate the value at risk so in non-parametric approaches like historical simulation we analyze the past data or the past daily returns of the s&p 500 or any index that we are considering and we analyze it to estimate the future and to estimate the var levels at different significance the losses that's occurring on the left tail cannot be calculated by using var this is one important shortcoming of the var the losses are calculated by the method of expected shortfall and is covered in the next in in the later session of our video series please keep subscribed to not miss any updates on these topics so what is the formal definition of var the value at risk or var is the probable minimum loss that a portfolio or investment can encounter daily over a given time horizon under a given confidence level so let's try to understand var with a 
with a hypothetical example. Let's say a portfolio manager manages a fund worth 1 million US dollar. He calculates the 5% value at risk to be 0.02 or 2%. We'll do the cal calculation of actual VAR in the later part. But let's suppose the fund manager has calculated the 5% VAR by the data anal analytical approach to be 0.02. So what does it mean? 5% VAR is equal to 2%. So the VAR, the 5% VAR we have calculated here is the decimal basis VAR as the VAR is represented by the decimal number, the number with the decimal. So the dollar basis of 5% VAR would be the decimal basis of 5% VAR multiplied by the portfolio value. Here, the fund manager manages a portfolio worth 1 million USD and the decimal basis 5% VAR he has calculated is 0 0.02. So we multiply these two to finally get 20,000 US dollar, which is the dollar basis of 5% VAR. So this portfolio's 5% VAR is 20,000 US dollar. So what does it mean? It means that loss from the portfolio will be minimum 20,000 US dollar in 5% of the holding period. Let's say the portfolio has been held for one year or 250 days. So 5% of 250 days is 12.5. So to repeat, 5% VAR tells us that loss from this portfolio of 1 million US dollar will be minimum $20,000 in 5% of the period that is in 12.5 days. Now let's quickly review the two approaches to calculate value at risk. The first approach is the parametric approach and the second approach is the non-parametric approach. In the parametric approach, the underlying distribution of the daily return data can be represented by a finite set of parameters or an equation. Examples of known distribution patterns or curves are normal distribution, log normal distribution, etc. And when the daily return data fits into any of these defined types of distribution, we know the equation from where the VAR can be measured. In the non-parametric approach, the underlying distribution cannot be defined or represented by a finite set of parameters. Non-parametric approach of VAR cal calculation is a data-driven approach where we analyze the past data and estimate the future. And this method is applied to calculate the VAR using this non-parametric approach. Historical simulation is an example or a type of non-parametric approach for calculating VAR. So let's try to understand how we calculate value at risk using the historical simulation approach. Historical simulation approach is a non-parametric approach. So suppose we have a 100-day data set of stock price. That is, we have 100 days of daily returns of a stock price. So the first step to calculate the VAR by historical data analytical approach method is that we sort the return column data from highest to lowest. So here we present the already sorted data. In the top part, we have the highest 10 returns and in the bottom part, we have the lowest 10 returns. The lowest return is minus 4.10%, 4.1% and the highest return during this period is 7%. So here we have 10 data points, here we have 10 data points out of 100 data points and the rest of the 80 data points are somewhere here that we haven't displayed. 
So suppose our VAR has a confidence level of 95%. That is, we would like to calculate the 5% significance VAR. So we need to know, this is the second step of the calculation. We need to know the 5% of the data set, that is total observation. Here we have 100 data set. So the 5% of 100 is 5. So we calculate the VAR by this method, which is the third step. The highest of the five lowest return is the 5% VAR by historical simulation. So this is the lowest, this is the second lowest, this is the third lowest, this is the fourth lowest, this is the fifth lowest. So these are the bottom uh, low returns uh, at the highest of these 5% returns is minus 2.4%. So our 5% VAR is 2.4% or 0 0.024. We have got read of the negative sign as value at risk or VAR contains the term risk which which has the negative sign in uh, incorporated in it. That is, risk is a negative sign by itself, so we don't explicitly write negative in VAR values. So let's take one uh, a practical example. Here we have taken the last one year data of S&P 500, that is from 24 June 2019 to 25 June. 2020 and we have sorted this data from highest returns to lowest returns in this table we have just showed the bottom 21 returns that the lowest 21 returns as we don't have enough space here so 5% significance of 253 that is the total observation for one year period is 5% into 253, which comes out to be 12.65. We then round it off to 13. So 5% VAR is the highest of the lowest 13 returns. So the highest of the lowest 13 returns comes out to be minus 3.0675%. So the 5% VAR which is the highest of the lowest 13 returns is equal to 0 0.030675. Note that we have rounded off this number here. So the 5% VAR of this portfolio, that is the dollar basis 5% VAR is equal to the 5% decimal basis VAR that we have calculated here multiplied by the portfolio amount, which we suppose to be 1 million. So the 5% value at risk of this portfolio is $30,675. So what does it mean again? We There is a 95% probability that the loss will be equal to or exceed $30,675 on any given day or the portfolio will experience lost amounting at least $30,675 or higher in 13 days out of 250 three days of holding period that is five percent of the holding period in the bottom this is the distribution plot of the same data here we have the bins on the lower side and the returns falling below the var level has been marked by red so our var level that is the five percent var level has been placed somewhere here So now let's discuss the algorithm that we'll deploy in our value at risk model in MATLAB. So in the previous case, we calculated the VAR for a 100 day or 253 day period. That is for 253 data points. But now let's suppose we have a really big data of 10,000 data points. And we'd like to calculate VAR for every 250 days under the 10,000 days whole period. 
so basically we calculate var for the first to 50 days and then second to 50 days the third to 50 days the fourth to 50 days until we reach the end of the 10,000 data points and we plot the var in a time series like fashion so how do we do that we order the returns from day 1 to day 251 and determine the highest of the lowest 5% of returns and this will be our 5% var for, for for the day 1 to day 251 we then again order the returns from day 2 to 252 and determine the highest of the lowest 5% of returns and this will be our 5% var for this period that is from 2 to 252 we repeat this process until we reach the days day count of 9750 to 10000 and finally we have extracted we have calculated the var for for this whole period with a interval of 250 days and we can plot this to and this plot will be called the 5% var model for the 10000 data points so how we did this modeling we actually extracted the S&P 500 data from an open source database and written a MATLAB code to find the var by historical simulation method described in the previous slide so we are not particularly biased toward MATLAB or we are not an affiliate of MATLAB we just felt that MATLAB codes are relatively easier for non-coding background professionals and will be picked up by them easily so here we present the model that we calculated with 7500 7, data points starting from 1990 to 2020 that is for three decades for 30 years we have around 7500 data points and for this we take a window of 250 days and we calculate var for every 250 days like we calculated two slides before the var here is not fixed but is a function of time and a function of the daily returns so that as the dispersion increases like that increased hugely during the period of 2008-9 crash the var levels also spiked from point around 0 0.02 to around 0 0.09 in the recent crash as well of 2020 due to covid the var levels has also increased to a significantly higher level which is close to 0 0.075 now so we have the two confidence level var here the 99 percent confidence level has been represented by the red line and the 95 percent confidence level var has been represented by the orange line this model only give us part of the picture the full picture will be can be investigated when we backtest this model with actual data so to briefly discuss backtest is the process of comparing the model with actual data to assess the goodness of the var we cover the var backtesting concepts in detail in the lecture 2 and we will also discuss concepts like exceedances and expectations so let's quickly go through the var level backtest of uh, on the uh, daily return data for this period of 1990 to 2020 so here in the violet line we have the daily returns from the s p 500 data or index and here we have negated the var values that is multiplied the var values by a negative sign to place the var on the negative side of the returns so here we can see that some of the returns has exceeded the var levels 
in several instances. So we would discuss how exceedances are interpreted in lecture 2. This is the topic for lecture 2. We are just briefly going through the models. Also in lecture 2 we will do the hands-on coding that is we would actually build this model and practice them in MATLAB so that we obtain the same image during that time. Also, the VAR models can be assessed by statistical methods. Here we can see that for the period, the historical 95% VAR, that is the VAR level of 95% has been accepted and the 99% uh, confidence level VAR has been rejected by the bin of the statistical method. So we'll discuss these terms bin, POF, TUFF in the next lecture and also see how the failures or exceedances are compared with the expected value and the ratio is determined to finally determine whether we can accept or reject a VAR with a certain confidence level or significance level. So the lecture one of this series ends here. To briefly state, in lecture two, we would cover, we'd build the actual VAR model for 95% and 99% confidence levels, and also backtest these two models which, with actual return data for this same period, that is starting from 1990 to 2020. We would also cover the statistical package of the MATLAB and Simulink and see how this package can be used to determine whether a model can be accepted in a particular period based on statistical parameters and statistical tests. So I hope to see you in lecture two. I hope your VAR modeling concepts is clear now if you have any question you can let us know in the comment section or you can reach us at pridexacademy at gmail.com we would love to see your replies and your feedbacks if you have any feedbacks on how we can improve please also state that that would be really useful to improvise our series please do subscribe our youtube channel so that you don't miss any updates and we also get some motivation i hope you have learned something new today thank you for your time i hope to see you in lecture two of the financial risk modeling part thank you for your time see you and stay safe